Railroad Inc. and Burgle Brothers are two of my favourite board games of all time. So this year, when they both release sequels, I should be excited, right? This is the problem with board game sequels. Take Railroad Inc., a game I love. So of course I was excited by the new sequels, Railroad Inc. Challenge. And now I have four versions of the same game. The trouble is, I don't have four times the desire to play Railroad Inc. I want to play it as much as any other game in my collection. So if all games are worth one point, each Railroad Inc. copy now has a shelf value of a quarter, and they're taking up space of other games that would offer a completely different experience. But John, this is Ricky. He watches the channel, and he speaks for all of you. The expansion dice make each version different. Yes, they help each game of Railroad Inc. feel different, but they still feel like Railroad Inc. So only keep one copy. But which one? Sometimes I might want to play with the rivers, sometimes the volcanoes, and do I keep original or the challenge version? Okay, so keep all the expansion dice, put them into one box, and get rid of the rest of the games. Throw away a perfectly good game, that's so wasteful. And the boxes are so beautiful. So keep all of them. But the shelf space, God, are you even listening? The appeal of a board game sequel is that at its heart, it's the same game you know and love. It's familiar and comforting. Amidst the thousands of new games released every year, a sequel is the only one you can guarantee you will enjoy. And that's true here. If you like Burgle Brothers or Railroad Inc, you will enjoy their sequel. The problem is, is that at their heart, they're the same game. So should you buy them? If you do, you are contributing to a growing trend. Frosthaven, the sequel to Gloomhaven, is the most successful board game Kickstarter ever, raising $13 million. I can't blame a publisher for taking an easy win. All they have to do is make changes to an existing design, and they have a ready fan base of backers. Burgle Brothers 2 and Hardback, both sequels, are Fowers Games' most successful Kickstarters, surpassing their originals by thousands of backers. When they've branched out with new original ideas like Sabotage and Now Boarding, the backers are less willing. Well, we didn't know if those games were any good. I get that, but if we only ever fund sequels, why would a publisher ever try anything new? It'll become like Hollywood where everything's a sequel or a remake. And when someone makes a half-decent original idea like Knives Out, it will be such a welcome surprise that everyone goes nuts over it. Oh, I love that film. I can't wait for the sequel. And if we encourage the sequelization of every game we love, aren't we holding ourselves back? As a fan, I'm torn. I'm naturally excited to see what they've added to a game I love, but when the Railroad Inc. designers aren't designing expansion dice sets for Railroad Inc., they produce something truly groundbreaking in King's Dilemma. But don't you want King's Dilemma too? Well, of course I do, but that's a story game. It doesn't count. We didn't need sequels to these games. They're already endlessly replayable. There is an oblivious gamer out there who owns one copy of Railroad Inc., has played it a hundred times, and has no idea three other versions exist. I wish I was that person. There is another species of gamer, Homo Kickstartus, who is obsessed with variability in games. They post comments of concern that it doesn't have enough cards or tiles or scenarios to make the game replayable, having never played the game. Tattoo this to your forehead. Variability does not equal replayability. Having more stuff in a game does not make it more fun, and it doesn't make you want to play it more. A great game, like Burgle Brothers 1, creates a unique puzzle every time you play by the way that 48 shuffle tiles interact with each other. This attitude that we need more of everything is behind the rise in sequels. It's the Kickstarterification of gaming, where every component is counted in a list that proclaims the value of your investment. If a game has variants and mini expansions, it's seen as more valuable, when in fact, it should be a red flag that if it needs all this additional fluff, it implies the basic game isn't fun on its own. The basic game of Railroad Inc. is fun, and thankfully Railroad Inc. Challenge has stuck with it. You roll four dice and draw the symbols on your board, trying to connect up exits. The first thing it adds is new icons on the map. If you draw in those spaces, you get something for it. For example, the factory lets you draw another space that turn. They're simple and effective, 
they tempt you away from completing routes by offering you something more enticing. You think, I could complete routes and get some freebies. But more often than not, you draw in something that creates you even more problems. It's classic roll and write stuff. Let the player trip themselves up by overreaching. Original Railroad Inc. already had that dynamic. Now there's more of it. The game also introduces goals, such as filling up a 3x3 grid or connecting one side of the map to the other. You're racing to complete them before the other players to get more points. And it's nice. It works. All the additions to Railroad Inc. Challenge make sense. They give you more to consider when building your map and more deadly incentives, but they definitely slow the game down. Railroad Inc. Challenge has twice the challenge and twice the analysis paralysis. If you add in the expansion dice as well, it's too much. I will never play with challenge and an expansion, but you don't have to. Every aspect is modular. It makes sense that a sequel adds more, and if you've milked Railroad Inc. dry, you might want it. But with a light travel game, less is more. And I already felt that Railroad Inc. was perfect. I'm not sure I need extra stuff. The makers have done their best to justify you owning four copies of Railroad Inc. There's the extra board so you can play with up to 20 players or challenge with eight players. Each set has four unique expansion dice, giving you two extra ways to play the game. And the challenge editions each have their own unique goal cards. Their cleverest justification is their new way to play the game in draft mode. Now the dice are rolled in pairs and you take it in turns to choose a pair of dice to use so everyone gets different routes. I was surprised by how much I enjoyed playing in draft mode. It makes the game less frustrating because you always get at least something you want each round. The catch is that to play in draft mode, you need a copy of Railroad Inc. for every player to give you enough dice. What I don't like is the new dice, not the expansion dice, the basic dice. They now have these useless and infuriating dead ends on them and these two separate roads. The other new changes to Railroad Inc. challenge make the game more difficult. The changes to the dice just make it more punishing. I really don't understand it. And if I do keep Railroad Inc. Challenge, I'm just going to use the dice from the original game. Hey, there's a reason to keep both. Before I give my thoughts on Burgle Brothers 2, I need to disclaim that Tim Fowers paid me to write some puns for the game. I know that sounds like something I would say as a joke, but it's not. Please take my career choices seriously. You're not my dad. Just as in the original Burgle Brothers, your team of characters are entering a building to crack a safe and exploring tiles by either running onto them or peeking first. In this sequel, you're robbing a casino and there are only two floors, which are now divided by this box stand because Kickstarter backers love gimmicks. It is fun to play the game in 3D, but I would have preferred the stand had been sold separately because it makes the box really annoying for storing the game. There is now only one safe to crack, but it is much harder to do and involves regular coordination between floors, encouraging you to really work together. As before, there are bouncers which move at the end of every turn and you need to avoid them. But they have a clever new mechanism. When you cause a commotion, the bouncer not only changes his destination to your location, but he moves one space closer. It means you always have to be careful when you're near them because you could get caught. And now getting caught gives you heat. Thematically, you're in disguise, hiding in plain sight. But the more the bouncers see you causing commotion, the more they suspect you. If you get six heat, you lose the game. It's another neat change that is slightly better than the original. Another fun thematic addition are these poker chips. When you reveal a new tile, you first reveal the person there. A saleswoman will corner you and not let you move again. And if you run onto a tile with a drunk, you crash into him and fall down a floor. Burgle Brothers was always great at providing fun surprises that add to the narrative of your game, and these tokens are totally in keeping with that. But they also add more randomness to an already lucky game. You're no longer safe when peeking at an adjacent tile because the prima donna could drag you in anyway, which robs you of the tactical choice of playing it safe. Once you crack the actual safe, you enter the finale. There are nine finale scenarios. They're cute, they add flavor, but at the same time, they disrupt the flow of the game because you have to stop and learn new rules, rules that aren't always clear. It reminds me of the haunt in Betrayal at House on the Hill. This faux campaign, the stickers that provide a legacy element, the meeples that are only used for one of the nine finale scenarios. 
they all feel like tricks to impress the Kickstarter crowd. Original Burgle Brothers didn't need them to make an entertaining, replayable game, and I don't think Burgle Brothers 2 does either. There's a trend with reviewers to say things like, Burgle Brothers 2 fixes all of the problems with Burgle Brothers. This is a Burgle Brothers killer. If you made me play Burgle Brothers again, I would puke everywhere. First of all, what problems? Burgle Brothers is an incredible game that didn't need fixing. But I also don't think that Burgle Brothers 2 does fix the problems they're talking about. Burgle Brothers 2 is way more streamlined. I don't think it is. Some parts have been streamlined, but other complications have been added to fill the void. For example, tiles that require you to track every time you enter with a cube, adding more admin to the game. Burgle Brothers 2 is so much shorter. I mean, barely. There is one less floor to explore and only one safe to crack, but it takes much longer to crack than before. And the finale acts like a third floor. If you're looking for a game that is half the length of the original, this isn't it. What it definitely doesn't fix is that if you didn't like Burgle Brothers, I believe you'll like Burgle Brothers 2 even less. It leans harder into its idiosyncrasies. But then, isn't that the point of a sequel? I did like it though, so should I get the game or not? All right, hold on, it's complicated. As a reviewer, there's a pressure to come down on one side or the other. Which one should you own? But it isn't that simple. There's a reason why I still own Pandemic and Pandemic Iberia and Pandemic Fall of Rome. Neither is better, each has their own benefits. And this is the ultimate problem of the sequel. I didn't need a new Burgle Brothers or Railroad Inc. I didn't ask for this dilemma. They are too similar to keep both, and they don't kill their originals. If anything, they've shone a spotlight on how good the originals are. If you've never played Burgle Brothers or Railroad Inc, this is really easy. You should try them. They are both brilliant games. And if you already have, you could try the sequels, or you could take a chance on the next great game. Invest in the next Burgle Brothers and encourage new ideas. Don't know what that game is? Well, subscribe to this channel and I'll let you know. That was the problem with board game sequels. If you'd like to support more videos like this, please become a patron of the channel at patreon.com forward slash actual I'm John Perkis. Thanks for watching.